celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross and with sacred hymns and with psalms when you appear on the last day and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever Peace be with the church and her children.
Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one we glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. O Christ, our God, by your precious cross, you have given us perfect salvation and have made us worthy to celebrate this feast of hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the holy cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you fulfill the words of the prophets, enlighten the apostles in their preaching, crown the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, Help the elderly, educate children, direct the youth, protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in your shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, so that we may walk with you toward death. And then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Sisters, let love be sincere. Hate what is evil, hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Anticipate one another in showing honor. Do not grow slack in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, endure in affliction, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the Holy Ones. Exercise hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Have the same regard for one another. Do not be haughty, or, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be concerned for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, on your part, live at peace with all. Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave room for the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, 
give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The lesson about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are in the same. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations shall be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visited you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you did not welcome me in. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they shall answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison? and not minister to your needs. And he will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least, you did not do for me. 
and these shall go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the truth, peace be with you. Let love be without simulation. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. In the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, it really takes off around the mid-century, around, let's just say, the World War II, is a thought first among Protestants and then it spreads among the Catholic world. And it's something that we can call secular perfectionism. They never called it that. So what is the idea? The idea is it was a moralistic opinion of the inherent goodness of mankind. Now in itself, it looks, that sounds fine, but it doesn't say that you expect and interpret the best interpretation in people. That's a different thing. This idea coming out of the social gospel movement of the 19th century that develops and begins to flourish is essentially a revival of Pelagianism. Pelagianism and Cardinal Ratzinger in the 90s and as Pope, he would refer to this as being one of the fundamental returns of heresy in our modern world one of them. <laughs> there is a whole series. But this is one of the most fundamental. Because Pelagianism, what it says is essentially the same thing. That the human person is intrinsically and inherently good. In other words, they will always choose good things. So then you ask the question, well then why does God become man and die on the cross? What does redemption actually mean then? And Pelagius, back in the 300s, taught that grace was a help to arrive at salvation. And this was condemned as a heresy. It is part of the controversies that St. Augustine is involved in, in the late 300s, early 400s. And it's called Pelagianism because the first and the major expounder of this idea was a very ascetic and apparently well thought of, prayerful, Welsh monk, but who traveled throughout Europe, who traveled throughout North Africa, was welcomed quite readily, but taught that there was no original sin. There is no fundamental wound in human nature. But human nature, it is a naive view, and one that is heterodox and directly contrary and contradictory of the church's teaching from the beginning that grace is necessary for salvation, not just an aid, it is necessary, to the point where the church teaches that even those who live in the state of grace, those who are in a habitual friendship with God, what we call the state of grace, still require actual grace to be given to even them for them to accomplish virtuous actions. And remember that actual grace just means the illumination of the mind, and the strengthening of the will to do what is good and to avoid evil. That even those who are in the state of grace, even those with faith and have been baptized, even those in the state of grace still require the actual grace of God to be holy and to do what is good. And so in this naive vision, we think, all right, well, this all sounds rather speculative, but it's not. When you consider then that of, in the naive view of the inherent goodness of mankind, that it's not wounded, that it's perfectly fine, then it means that when I think I'm doing fine, I'm not just fine, I have a moral clarity about things. I know this is the way it's supposed to be. 
But it also means that then when I see my neighbor who's not choosing the same thing, it's no longer just a disagreement. It means if, he's in, if he is inherently good, then when he is choosing something that I judge to be bad or wrong, it means that he is violating that goodness. So he's not just one sinner in disagreement with another sinner, which is the way the world has always seen these things. Nations go to war not because one is good and one is evil. Nations go to war because they have a misunderstanding over two clumps of nations of sinners. But when we judge this false premise of the inherent goodness, of this false notion, that it means that when I see someone choosing something that I consider wrong, it must mean not only that we disagree, but it means that this person necessarily is malicious because he's choosing something that is clearly wrong. That is the modern world. So it sounds very redemptive and very nice about human beings being morally always upright in this Pelagianistic idea, this Pelagian idea. But it means on that level that the other person who is choosing something different is not just mistaken, but is also necessarily evil. This is why we have no discourse on the social level any longer. People we disagree with, we just simply cut off and we isolate them from us. And with social media, all that did was accelerate it in the last 20 years. It's all very logical. But that's on the natural level. Remember, I tell you, this really begins to accelerate around the middle of the 20th century. And the problem with Pelagianism is not whether people are good or bad. It's about the question of who is the Lord Jesus and what is redemption? If human beings are inherently good and grace doesn't do anything other than give you a bit of a help to arrive at salvation, well then what is religion for? If we're all inherently good and the idea just becomes a moralistic view of the gospel, that's where you get the attitude of, oh, I'm a good person. I don't need the sacraments. I don't need to confess in penance. I don't have to make acts of contrition. I'm good, and Jesus loves me. So notice at the middle of this epistle today, because where we read this, this begins actually in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be sincere, sometimes it's translated. It says, let love then be the pursuit of the good and the perfection without duplicity. That in itself on the natural level is already very hard. On the supernatural level, this is extraordinary. So today, what I want you to do is, during this week, is read this whole chapter 12 of the letter to the Romans. It is one of the most exquisite tests in the New Testament. <clears throat> And I was commenting with someone, talking with someone recently, and I said, this text, this text should be carved in gold and mounted in every parish hall of every parish. Cover the whole wall, this chapter. It is one of the most austere, the demanding, and chastening chapters in the New Testament. It, start, it ends by saying, so do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. This is a totally different vision. And the naturalistic vision of this secular perfectionism, everything disappears. Human nature becomes volatile against one member or against another. The church becomes something which is irrelevant, except for I like it. Because in the end, this is a sentimentalistic vision of Christianity. It is not Christianity, which is why it has spawned so many problems and errors in the Western world. The middle of this, in this chapter, then, he says, hate what is evil. Not people hate what is evil and cling, cling to what is good. 
adhere to what is good. That is the central part of chapter 12. It ends with this idea then of saying, if your enemy is hungry, as our Lord's quoting, St. Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. Our Lord also quotes this in his teachings. But quoting from the old law, he says, if your enemy is hungry, give him to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him to drink. Make yourself do what is good, even if they're in opposition to you. That's nothing short of heroic. If we ride on a naturalistic Pelagian idea, we will always despise the other person when we disagree with them. It's one thing to be angry because you're disagreeing. It's another to consider the other person evil. This is why in our social communications, why, even on the natural level, why this has become so horrific. You think about the politicking going on these days. It's not just that I disagree with this party or that party. That person is treasonous. That person's destroying democracy. That person is destroyed. You hear it all the time. This is insane. And it develops out of this degenerative form of Christianity that finds its origin. It's always been around, but really took on monumental momentum at the end of the 19th century and really came to a tsunami wave in the middle of the 20th century and just has crashed across everything in the Western world. On this supernatural level, it's why all of your cousins and your brothers and your sisters and your parents and your children never go to Mass because it's not necessary. If people are inherently good, the death of Christ is no longer, as the church teaches, essential for the salvation of the individual. You can look this all up in the catechism if you want. In fact, I encourage you, look up Pelagianism. Look up the actual teaching of the church. So on a supernatural level, the church was made redundant and irrelevant in that mentality of that idea. Oh, we hung on for a while. We hung on through the 60s, perhaps. And then it all just came crashing out from the 70s onward. And it has continued to this day. There is a logical reason why that comes. That's on the supernatural level. But on the natural level, it is why we have this, discon this discord in any kind of conversation. We don't just simply disagree. We hate and this is horrible. We can disagree without being disparaging. And because someone disagrees with someone else doesn't mean that the other person is evil. And the person with whom this disagreement is about doesn't mean that the person who disagrees hates you in the Christian vision. Disagreements will always be around the question is, is how do we cling to the good and accomplish it? So I ask you to read this whole chapter because then, only then, will what we have read today in the text make more sense. Because the very beginning of this chapter says by St. Paul, do not be conformed to the world. Do not think like the world thinks. If your mind is similar to CNN or Fox or whatever, and that's the way you think because those are your principles, that is the world. I don't care if it's left or right or Republican or Democrat. It's all this world, which is why it walks around wounded, staggering, and filled with hatred and discord. It is chapter 12 of the letter to the Romans. So St. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You have been given illumination by grace to think in a different way, to think as Christ thinks. And this is hard because God stripped himself of everything that was due to him, glory, majesty, and came among us in simplicity and poverty as a family, in a family, and as a carpenter from Nazareth. We are given this vision to be renewed in the spirit of our mind because it's the only way that we can actually do this. 
We cannot accomplish this otherwise. Catholic morality is not the question of gritting my teeth and trying not to do evil things. That doesn't make any sense. That's like trying not to have cancer. It will not make you healthy. To be healthy requires the renewal of the mind. And he says that you render yourselves, your bodies, he says, in a seasonable, in a reasonable service. Reasonable here means spiritual. You render your very lives concretely, materially, your bodies themselves to God's service so that you may be able to discern what is the will of God. This chapter is so profoundly on target, which is not surprising, it's inspired, but especially so for us in the 21st century. Because this renewal of the mind and the service that we render brings us to the ability to see what is God's will. And he says then to be able to judge what is the good and the honorable and the pleasing thing to God. When we understand those first two lines of this chapter, then everything else flows logically. The same way that all of the horrors that flow from a secular perfectionism, so the vision of the renewal of the mind of the Christian illuminated, also everything logically falls. Let your love be without falsity. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. And in the end, do what is good, not because you're a dupe. It is important to realize the end of the chapter. He says, quoting from the Proverbs, if you're giving food to your enemy who is hungry, or you're giving drink to your enemy who is thirsty, it's not to be a dupe and just do things while people spit on you. He says, you do this in order that you heap burning coals upon their heads. You win. We've hopefully, each one of us, I know I certainly have found people like this, but to be in the presence of someone who always tries to do good, even when we have done something stupid against them, and they return to us goodness, it makes you want to crawl under a rock, does it not? Is it not humiliating to have someone return an argument by being pleasant? This is what our Lord means. This is what St. Paul means when he says, feed your hungry enemy, give drink to your thirsty enemy, because you will win. You will heap burning coals upon their head, which is why the very last line is, so do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Makarios of Jerusalem. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
Continue with the anaphora of Saint Mark the Evangelist on page 835. 835. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true and holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. <coughs> May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to our spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. To the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God the Father, maker of all creation, with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. 
the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts, bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kingdom and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you, and through you, and with you, implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them, and because of them, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you. Our faith in you, we ask you, who appeared in the form of the Son 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 of
How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit to send and rest upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin Mario, Manin Mario, Manin Mario, Nite Mararacha Chayu Kodisho, Onachen Nalainu Alukurbono, O no. Abed Lachmono, Fahururum Shiho alone, Dilan. Ulamza Hodam Consono, Dimo delayed him, Shiho alone, Dilan. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor of building and strengthening of your holy church and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world, Protect her shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives. Especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar of Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in your tranquility. Protect them by the sign <coughs> of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travel. Grant your eternal reward to monks, to those who live solitary lives and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists. John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Macarius, and all the saints. May we join their ranks and share in their <coughs> joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysius, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Be mindful, O Lord those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, 
We hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are ours now. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. Shlomo el Wa Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it, through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, 
to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever. Again and again, <clears throat> we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
O God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Shlomo el Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and of your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <coughs> Leave you in peace.